The FDA recently announced that it would ban traditional menthol cigarettes and cigars. Menthol's the only remaining flavor allowed in tobacco products, even though it's been in the crosshairs of public health advocates for a long time. So what's the big fuss? Why ban menthol products specifically? That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. No final date has been set for the menthol ban, and we can definitely expect legal challenges from tobacco companies that stand to lose billions. Because even though cigarette smoking has been on the decline for many years, sales of menthol cigarettes have increased. The potential reasons for this range from how menthol might change the way nicotine is experienced to how it affects smoking rates among particular groups due to things like taste and marketing. Menthol itself is a physiologically active compound that may affect several aspects of the smoking experience. It's difficult to isolate its exact role in any particular process because it's mixed in with thousands of other chemicals found in tobacco products. But literature suggests that it could affect nicotine absorption and metabolism, respiration patterns, nervous system activity, and carcinogenic properties, all of which may increase the potential for nicotine addiction and overall toxicity. In terms of quitting smoking, the data are mixed on whether menthol smokers have a harder time quitting and or increased rates of relapse in the long term. A 2011 cross-sectional analysis found that menthol smokers were less likely to quit than their non-menthol smoking counterparts. However, in a 2008 report containing a secondary analysis of data from a randomized controlled trial on smoking cessation, researchers reported that smoking cessation was not decreased among menthol smokers. Young smokers are the most likely age group to use menthol cigarettes, making the banning of this product potentially beneficial for youth. Between 2012 and 2014, 53.9% of current smokers between the ages of 12 and 17 were smoking menthols, with use being highest amongst youngest users. And since data indicate that established smoking is more likely to occur when an individual starts with menthol versus non-menthol cigarettes, this benefit could extend across the lifespan if it results in younger individuals never starting to smoke. Banning menthol cigarettes may also help to address racial health disparities. Use of menthol cigarettes is disproportionately high among African Americans. Some sources estimate that nearly 9 in 10 smokers in this group use menthol products, and data suggests that marketing of these products is heavily targeted at this population. So, from a public health perspective, banning menthol-flavored cigarettes is a big win. But not everyone feels the same. As covered in a recent Stat News article, opposition to the menthol ban has been fierce for a long time. Tobacco companies rely on profits from their menthol products, particularly because overall tobacco sales have been decreasing for a long time. Some lawmakers have expressed opposition because of the hit their state budgets will take when taxes from the sale of menthol products are no longer coming in, and various advertisers and smoke shop owners have protested their profit losses as well. As a public health channel, our support swings in the direction of people over profits, and we find the data on menthol products and public health to be strongly in support of the ban, so we're in favor. Others have argued that banning menthol products will simply drive all users to non-menthol products. However, data from Canada looking at smoking behaviors before and after menthol bans suggests that while about 59% of smokers did switch to non-menthol cigarettes and 19.5% were able to obtain menthols elsewhere, 21.5% of those surveyed did end up quitting smoking. That may seem small, but we'll take the wins where we can get them. Change is hard, but changing the environment is a powerful way to change behavior, and if the outcome of that change is a blow to the leading cause of preventable death in the United States, we can't help but say that's probably a good thing. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You might enjoy this recently completed series funded by the NIHCM Foundation on vaccines. We'd also appreciate it if you'd like and subscribe to the show down below and consider going on over to patreon.com slash healthcare triage where you can make the show bigger and better even during a global pandemic. We'd especially like to thank our research associates, James Glasgow, Joe Sevitz, Josh Gister, and Michael Chin, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral Sam.